Good morning, everybody. I hope that everybody is hearing me well. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of the attendees. Hi, I'm Mrs. Alexandra Duval. I'm VP Marketing and Communication responsible for education. Today, Peter Surgical is pleased to help to facilitate a new webinar from Peter's Academy. Peter's Academy was born this year, considering Peter Surgical can help surgical community to better exchange and learn for each other about local challenges and expertise. Today, we are honored uh, to welcome three hosts for the webinar dedicated to surgical management of complex congenital cardiac anomalies. First series will be conotruncal anomalies. Uh, we are honored to welcome Professor Emre Belli, uh, who is the co-director of pediatric and congenital heart disease in France, in the hospital of Marie-Land Long Hospital close to Paris, in Le Plessis Romanson. We are honored to welcome Dr. Hayer from India, the executive director of the Department of Congenital and Pediatric Cardiac Surgery from the Fortis Escort Hospital in Delhi. And we are also honored to welcome from China, Professor Chong Jun Li, Director of Pediatric Cardiovascular Surgery in the hospital from Fun Wai Yuan Song Cardiovascular in Sengchu. Before I leave the talk to Professor Belli as a moderator, I just would like to share with you a few logistic elements from this webinar. The agenda. Uh, Dr. Ayer will start first to present his uh, uh, information and his knowledge from the technology of follow. Uh, this presentation will be followed by a, smart, a short quiz and exchange of question and answer. The second presentation will be done by Professor Belli on the transposition of grid arteries. And we also prepare some small quiz. And the third one uh, is uh, presented by Dr. Lee, which be the transposition of the grid arteries with pulmonary stenosis and the third quiz and question and answer with the conclusion. Today, the webinar will be in English. You have been all mute as a attendees. If you want to ask any question, please use the question section and we'll have, as you understood, some dedicated time. Last point will be that uh, this session will be registered. And of course, you will access to the free replay after today. So I will leave the talk to Professor Belli to introduce this webinar. Thank you for all. And I will stop sharing. And Professor Belli, you can, uh, you can start. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, all the uh, introduction is already made by uh, our uh, friend uh, from uh, uh, Madame Duval from uh, Peter's company. Then we will start with the presentation of Dr. Ayer. The aim of the uh, aim of the uh, presentation uh, on this uh, common anomalies is to have a, a very clinical and surgical view to this uh, common. And, and complex anomalies in order to uh, demystify clinical and surgical uh, specific points and also to debate uh, in an interactive manner with the audience as much as we can. We know that we cannot uh, directly de debate uh, with the audience in, from some countries, but whoever meets our meeting is free Shall, shall feel free to participate and ask questions uh, anytime. Uh, Dr. Ayer, up to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Belli. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Peter Surgical for organizing this online webinar on conotruncal anomalies. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Uh, my name is Krishna Ayer. I am the executive director from Fortis Escorts Heart Institute, New Delhi. I hope I'm audible and the video is clear. The slides are there. Alexandra, is things okay? 
Perfect. You can go on, Dr. Aya. Okay. Thank you. So, I have no disclosures and all the patient photographs that have been shown here are with permission. As I mentioned, this is the hospital that I work in, in New Delhi. It's a 300 bedded heart and super specialty center, which has been in existence since 1988. So we're going to be talking today about Tetralogy of Fallow. And as you're all well aware that the lesion essentially consists of a large unrestricted ventricular septal defect and varying degrees of right ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And these are the two surgical issues that need to be addressed at the time of surgery. Going briefly through the anatomy, as you're aware that essentially it's a conotruncal anomaly and we look at the normal right ventricular outflow tract and look at the septum from the right ventricular aspect, you see a large structure here. This is a septum marginal trabeculation which breaks into the anterior and the posterior limbs. And there is a ventricular infundibular fold and a membrane septum and the uh, outlet of the subpulmonary infundibulum, which all constitute the right ventricular outflow. Now, essentially, in Tetralogy of Fallow, there is a large outlet septum which gets malaligned. It does not fuse with the trabecular septum marginalis, essentially, thereby leaving a large ventricular septal defect, which is classically subiotic in nature. And the two limbs of the septum marginal trabeculation actually then form the inferior margin of the ventricular septal defect. Surgically, it's important that when there is no muscular tissue at the posterior inferior margin, the conduction axis is at danger here because it is very superficial in this area where there's continuity between the aortic valve and the tricuspid valve. But in many instances, that uh, tissue may be replaced with muscle and you can have a muscular posterior inferior margin in which case the conduction bundle is significantly away from the margin and is relatively protected. An understanding here of what we mean by overriding and this is a, a 3D representation from a CT taking a cut through the aortic valve as you can see that's the circumference of the aortic valve and you can see that the crest of the interventricular septum it cuts right across the a plane of the aortic valve showing clearly how the aortic valve overrides the ventricular septal defect. So in actual fact, there are three different planes to this interventricular communication. And in order to connect the left ventricle to the aorta, the ventricular septum has to be partitioned in this plane, that's the green disc rather than here or here, although all these are components of the interventricular communication. There are a few variants to the classical tetralogy of fallow. The patients who don't have a pulmonary valve well formed with rudimentary nubbins of pulmonary valve tissue are present. It's called tetralogy with absent pulmonary valve. The valve may be atritic and it's called VSD with pulmonary atresia. The interventricular septal defect can be in the form of an atrioventricular septal defect. And occasionally we can have absence of the left or right pulmonary arteries. And sometimes in association with diminutive or hypoplastic pulmonary arteries, there can be major iota pulmonary collateral arteries, and that's a separate entity known as pulmonary atresia VSD mapcurs. Surgery is the only treatment option for tetralogy of fallow, and preferably today, a one-stage total correction should be the aim for all patients. However, in many instances, palliative surgery in the form of shunts still have an important role, and we will come to that in a little while. So we'll briefly talk about the Blaylock toxic, and currently it's called the Blaylock toxic Thomas shunt in order to give credit to the third person who was involved in this, that's Vivian Thomas. And the original shunt was the classical Blaylock toxic shunt, which was a turn down of the ipsilateral subclavian artery and anastomosis to the ipsilateral pulmonary artery, later modified by Mark de Laval et al by the interposition of a PTFE graft between the subclavian and the pulmonary artery. And this is the procedure that is currently commonly performed. So historically, this was the landmark operation which changed the face of cardiac surgery for children with congenital heart disease. And this is the first shunt operation performed in 1944 by Dr. Blaylock. So what does a Blaylock toxic shunt achieve? Essentially, it diverts some blood from the systemic to pulmonary circulation, thereby increasing pulmonary blood flow and improving systemic oxygen saturation. The addition of the pulmonary blood flow also promotes growth of the pulmonary arteries, which is useful when there is hypoplastic pulmonary arteries. 
However, shunts have a disadvantage because it's still an unphysiological and a palliative procedure. And shunt overflow can result in systemic hypoperfusion, especially in very small babies. It can result in pulmonary edema, which is often transient, but significantly in certain situations can be low enough to cause coronary steel and coronary ischemia. In the long term, it can cause acute or chronic heart failure and can cause pulmonary or vascular obstructive disease if the shunt has been there for several years. Of course, in the acute post-operative period, a shunt can block acutely and cause hemodynamic instability. And in the long term also, the pulmonary artery can get distorted if the shunt has been in place for a long time. But however, corrective surgery remains the main goal for all these patients. And we credit Walton Lilyhai, the father of cardiac surgery, with the first successful corrections of Tetralogia Fallow. And this was the landmark publication in 1955. Of course, notable that the first few operations were done with the technique of controlled cross circulation. And over the years, as we can see here, that the survival of patients born with tetralogy of fallow has steadily improved with each decade. And this is data from the Toronto Children's Hospital. As you can see that in the current era, one can expect a survival which nears 100%. And likewise, the age at which corrective surgery is offered has also steadily come down over the decades. And today, in most parts of the world, especially the developed world, Corrective surgery is often very early in infancy. So I'll briefly talk about what is the optimal timing for surgery because that has a bearing in different parts of the world. Today in the developed or the countries where very good neonatal and infant cardiac surgery facilities are available, many centers report a near zero early mortality even when neonates are operated upon. And the debate largely now centers around there whether or at all a palliative surgery needs to be done in any patient. In fact, the results are often so good that many justify doing an elective neonatal repair even if the patient is asymptomatic. Just to give you an example, this is a center from Austria where they compared mortality in patients operated in the neonatal period versus those operated in the early infant period and there was no mortality in either group. And the only difference was that there was a significantly higher incidence of transangular patching in the neonatal group. So if you look at it logically, then in most centers, the treatment algorithm is in the following way. This is the algorithm proposed by Tom Carl et al. That if the patient is symptomatic in the neonatal period and is either duct dependent uh, or not, but if it is symptomatic or duct dependent, then they require a neonatal operation and the pulmonary arteries are adequate, they'd go for a complete repair. If they are hypoplastic, they would go for a leloctosic shunt. And if there are no symptoms asymptomatic, then most would prefer to do an elective operation by the age of six months, unless the pulmonary arteries are hypoplastic in which they would go through a two-stage approach. If a patient has had a previous shunt, then when do you do the next correction? And then it basically depends upon the indication for the shunt. And if the shunt has been done for small pulmonary arteries, then whenever the pulmonary arteries are adequate in size, one would proceed with a total correction. If it's been done because facilities for open heart surgery are not available, you send to an appropriate facility where it can be done. Or if it's done for young age, then by and large, anytime after six months, a corrective surgery could be done. If there is evidence, of course, in the interim that the shunt flow is inadequate and the patient is getting progressively sinus, then of course, uh, one would have to proceed with a correction earlier. What are the goals of corrective surgery? First is to aim to complete and secure closure of the ventricular septal defect. And second is the adequate relief of the right ventricular obstruction. While preserving both right and left ventricular functions, AV conduction, competence of the tricuspid valve, and pulmonary competence as far as possible. And the entire successful outcome of a patient undergoing surgery for tetralogy of fallow depends on these following five criteria, a proper case selection, a good preoperative preparation, appropriate intraoperative management, a quick and accurate repair, and a tailored postoperative care. And this is important because patients can come on a wide age spectrum. 
The preoperative evaluations very quickly goes through all these parameters, but the most important investigation today is the 2D color Doppler echo, which is the mainstay for diagnosis of these patients. In the past, cardiac catheterization and angiography used to be done for almost every patient with tetralogy of fellow and was the gold standard. However, today, echo remains the gold standard and majority of the neonates and infants can have complete diagnosis and proceed for surgery on the basis of an echo alone. However, there are some instances where cardiac catheterization and angiography may be required, and I'll come to that. The checkpoints on echo are to look at the entire uh, sequential chamber analysis of the heart. You look at the venous connections, the right ventricular function. You look at the right ventricular outflow, size of the annulus, the size of the pulmonary arteries. Most importantly, one needs to see the location and the number of VSTs. Are they single or multiple? And lastly, uh, idea of the coronary anatomy and presence of collaterals or other shunts is important while evaluating these patients. When is CAT and CT angio indicated if the echo windows are poor and the cardiologist is not satisfied with the information derived or the surgeon is not satisfied? And usually this happens when the branch PAs are not well visual visualized or if there are multiple VSDs or there are suspicion of collateral which might need intervention then a CT angio or a cath or both may be required for further evaluation. Collaterals are important, especially in older patients. This may not get picked up on echocardiography. And if there is a suspicion, an angiogram is warranted. And even in patients with classical tetralogy, one can see large collaterals like this, or even smaller collaterals, which can be quite bothersome if not addressed. In many parts of the world, especially the LMICs, Patients often present quite significantly late and can present with profound polycythemia like these two patients, a younger adolescent or an older patient. And when they present late, then one has to very closely look at the hematology and the coagulation profile. These patients are often malnourished and they may have multi-organ dysfunction like renal function. So it's important to look for all these. Most importantly, a CT brain scan is very important to look for occult infarcts or bleeds because these can be catastrophic in the post-operative period. Our policy is often to do a phlebotomy and replacement with fresh frozen plasma in order to correct hematological abnormalities, especially when a patient presents like this, an eight-year-old child who had a hemoglobin of 24 grams, a hematocrit of 80, and a platelet count of 40,000 per cubic millimeter. Obviously, when you subject such a patient to cardiopulmonary bypass, there is a potential for catastrophic hemorrhage Mediastinal hemorrhage is common but can be easily controlled. But if you have a hemorrhage like this, it's a bleed into the brain, then that can be catastrophic. When you come to corrective surgery, we have a choice between transatrial and the transventricular approach. Today, data suggests that the transatrial approach is the superior approach. However, if you are committed to doing a transventricular approach, then the disadvantages can be nullified by use of a smaller ventriculotomy. This is the transatrial approach, and you can see you get an excellent exposure of the ventricular septal defect with the iota, uh, aortic valve seen through this, the right ventricular outflow with an os infundibulum, very tight stenosis of the, the hypertrophy uh, tuberculations, which are causing obstruction to the right ventricular outflow. The VSD can be closed with interrupted or continuous sutures depending upon individual preference and may be closed with Nacron cloth, PTFE or autologous or bovine pericardium. It doesn't really matter as long as the VSD is closed securely. Uh, in my own experience, I find it useful to undersize the patch a little because that allows to pull the infundibular septum down and open the right ventricular outflow tract more. I suture along the edge and, and along the aortic annulus. It's important to make sure that you don't injure the aortic valve and you ensure that the tricuspid valve is competent at the end of the VSD closure. The infundibular resection is the most important aspect of the surgery. You resect mainly the parietal bands and avoid the septal bands unless they're discrete and obstructive. We avoid cutting the moderator band. How much to resect is an important visual judgment. If you cut too little, you'll leave residual right ventricular outflow. If you cut too much, you can cause right ventricular distension. The decision for a transannular patch is dependent upon the sizing of the pulmonary annulus after the resection of the infundibulum and the pulmonary valvotomy. If the annulus does not accept the required size of the Hegar dilator, then you proceed to put a transannular patch. 
In patients with a very fibrous annulus or a doubly committed ventricular septal defect, it's wiser to put a transannular patch even if the pulmonary annulus just accepts the adequate size HEGA. It's important also to size the patch adequately. If you put an oversized patch, then one can result in a situation like this post-operatively where you get a distal uh, stenosis at the bifurcation because of ballooning of the patch. Or you can actually get an aneurysm of the patch like this because of the hemodynamic consequences of a oversized patch. So sizing of the patch is very important. These patients often have stenosis of the left or right pulmonary artery and important technique described by Dr. Roger May from Melbourne is how to address the left pulmonary artery stenosis is important to correct the keel at the back of the origin. Uh, and likewise, if there is bilateral stenosis, then it's important to augment the posterior wall by this sort of an incision and the plasty in order to get a correct opening of both the pulmonary arteries. Sometimes there may be an anomalous coronary artery which is crossing the right ventricular outflow tract and that can also be reasonably well dealt in most cases by angulating the incision across the right ventricular outflow. Usually there is some distance between the annulus and the coronary artery and you can achieve through a transatrial transpulmonary approach a complete repair even in these patients. Our aim is to do an intracardiac epicardial echo in all these patients at the end of surgery. And uh, our preference is to this because you get very excellent imaging. You can see this ventricular septal defect patch seen quite well here at the end of surgery. And then you can see the right ventricular outflow. That's the pulmonary valve. You can see that this is a fairly non-obstructive right ventricular outflow with a gradient of only 20. Our aim is often to leave a slight ventricular septal, uh, light gradient across the right ventricular outflow. As you can see here, you can see the branch pulmonary arteries through a transiotic view and a good left ventricular function. When you have a dynamic right ventricular outflow obstruction at the end of surgery, that's usually desirable if you have a gradient of 20 to 30 because that preserves the right ventricle better. And uh, we had shown this in our publication way back in 1999 where dynamic obstruction led to better preservation of the right ventricular outflow. Post-operative pulmonary regurgitation is attempted to be minimized, and this can be done when you do a transatrial repair with a minimal ventriculotomy. And if you accept mild residual RVOTO, so that if a pulmonary valve annulus is even up to minus two standard deviation, it's generally acceptable. Avoiding neonatal repair is also important, minimizing, because as I mentioned, there's a higher chance of putting a transannular patch. And often you can also do some repair of the pulmonary valve, like for example, the Sung's repair, where the transected pulmonary valve leaflets are augmented with a separate patch of either pericardium or PTFE in order to reconstruct the valve and create a bicuspid valve. This is known as the Sung's repair and is supposed to provide at least reasonably a good pulmonary valve competence in the early period. Some of the post-op issues that we do is that we have a liberal use of inodilators in the post-operative period. We try to extubate early. And most importantly, in tetralogies, we don't use epinephrine because we feel that's a precursor for JET. And so in our experience, ever since we stopped using epinephrine, our incidence of JET is extremely low. PEEP is avoided unless the patient has one hemorrhage, which is not uncommon in older patients like this, who are very polycythemic and Unlike the conventional teaching that in tetralogy, PEEP should not be used, but when we have lungs like this with intrapulmonary hemorrhage, PEEP is required in order to produce, provide adequate ventilation. Intracranial bleed is still a problem in some of these patients, and important that these patients have a pre-op CT, frequent monitorings of the pupils in the post-operative period, and a rapid response if there's a pupillary change with CT and urgent nuclear screen. Just to give an example, one of the adult patients who was very polycythemic in the immediate post-op, had pupillary change, urgent CT, which showed a subdural hematoma, a large one, was immediately evacuated in the neuro. Two days later, he had another bleed and the second evacuation, but after two neurosurgical interventions, he went home in four weeks, completely normal with no neurological deficit. So, some of the adult patients may also require a pulmonary valve placement at the first surgery itself, in order to prevent right ventricular dysfunction. So to conclude, the ideal tetralogy repair is one that should be suitable for all ages and weights, produce good relief of RVOTO and prevent hypertrophy. 
It should provide complete atrial and ventricular septation. One can try and avoid a ventriculotomy and circulatory arrest, preserve pulmonary valve and tricuspid valve function. You should have a low early mortality and morbidity and achieve a good functional status and quality of life. And lastly, freedom from reoperation and late mortality. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, questions are welcome. I have a short video, time permitting, I will show that later. Thank you very much, Dr. Er. Excellent presentation covering in 15 minutes uh, all the uh, aspects. I can, we can, we can uh, pursue with the quiz questions, uh, Madame Duval. So the uh, these questions are uh, we have four questions. You have to answer all of them in order to have an idea of our audience and their experience. You can slide the uh, screen down, and uh, you have a uh, one minute to uh, answer the questions. While waiting, we will look into the quiz questions and to the uh, chat questions. Uh, Dr. Ayer, yeah. uh, how much time is the learning cur curve to earn to operating a tough patient safely by Lamar Muhammad? Uh, a very difficult question. I think it depends, varies from surgeon to surgeon, but it's an evolving. I mean, I think uh, I still find every patient of tetralogy is different. And it takes, at least for me, it took me at least four to five years before I was reasonably very comfortable with handling all the various patterns of tetralogy. Uh, the, as I mentioned, the most important judgment call here is the resection of the transatrial resection of the right ventricular outflow, the infundibulum, how much to cut and where uh, to cut in order to prevent yourself coming out of the heart of the lung. So the closure of the ventricular septal defect is relatively straightforward and repairing the pulmonary artery is relatively straightforward. So the most difficult learning aspect is the extent of the transventricular for the trans, uh, the infundibular resection. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Um, Raja Lahiri asked, what is the drawback of doing a neonatal repair, especially with the reference to placement of a transcendular patch? Yes. The, the problem with neonatal repairs is that the ICU stay is significantly prolonged because they go through a phase of significant low cardiac output. And if you look at all the papers which talk about neonatal repair, usually the length of ICU stay and length of stay, hospital stay is significantly prolonged. The counter argument is that they say that if the patient has to have two operations, that it means a shunt as well as a further corrective surgery, then the total length of hospital stay becomes the same. But the issues are that a neonate subjected to a long ICU stay and a long hospital stay can have long-term uh, neurological issues. Uh, so a lot of these issues are still unanswered. And that's the reason why most surgeons prefer not to do elective surgery in the neonatal period. Perfect. So Alexandra, can we go to the results? Yes, I'm going to share with you the results. Could you see the results? Perfect. So modified blade of Tausig shunt remains the most common without, I, I didn't doubt on it, and uh, 75%. Uh, however, some uh, cardiologists uh, still uh, trying to keep our patients in their cat lab and ductal stent uh, rate probably will increase in time. Uh, the majority, half of the uh, participants repaired the tetralogy before six months of age, which is very, very uh, modern. Uh, when we looked at our audience is uh, mainly from uh, 
areas where uh, neonatal uh, diagnosis, prenatal diagnosis is not that common. And the uh, transatrial approach appeared to gain ag against the uh, infundibular VSD closure. Uh, it has become uh, uh, the standard procedure even for myself, which is uh, from trained by the generation of uh, infundibular closure, however, switching to transatrial closure. And the finally, uh, autologous pericardium, heterologous or synthetical are quite equal, uh, which is interesting as, a, as information uh, and probably doesn't change outcome in this issue. Uh, thank you. So I will pursue with my presentation, which concerns uh, the uh, tetralog the uh, transposition of grid arteries. Uh, I will do less anatomical, more surgical uh, than my friend uh, Krishna. So many things are improved since 40 years in the management of the transposition of grid arteries uh, being repaired neonatally by anatomical repair, allowing outstanding results and uh, uh, excellent quality of life. Um, now the challenge is no more the survival uh, or residual reagents, but more likely to improve the non-cardiac outcome come by uh, shortening the exposure of the patients to all deleterious effects of his uh, um, preoperative pre circulation and also perioperative uh, uh, nocif exposures like uh, anesthesia, uh, CPB, and uh, all these other factors which are uh, influencing uh, long outcome and quality of life. Arterial switch operation is performed for all types of transposition of grid arteries, including the corrected ones, and also for thousand being hearts has become the procedure of choice. Uh, our institutional initial series were the first series around the world uh, the, for transposition of grid arteries in newborns. And uh, started in early 80s. The, already the results were more likely satisfactory. In recent years, we performed um, a, um, a study on up to 900 uh, simple TGA and many informations show how the improvement was, has figured out with the mortality, intensive care stays, rate of prenatal diagnosis, uh, the, the timing for diagnosis, cardiopulmonary bypass time, cross clamping time, and uh, uh, what didn't change that uh, we still do balloon septostomy, and of course the preoperative saturations remains around 80 or to 90. What is a perfect switch now in our institution? So the procedure time is around two hours with less than one hour for myocardial uh, ischemic time. We use uh, reduced cardiopulmonary bypass circuit and avoid transfusion by one uh, red cells and one plasma unit. We use normothermia at least uh, at the recent uh, years, and intermittent anti-grade uh, warm blood to, to uh, perfuse and keep uh, uh, non-beating the heart. We use a more likely redon drains, which are smaller, and for, uh, of course, with pacemaker wires, we use enoximon, only enoximon for all patients, um, and uh, 
just the morphine for pain in ICU. Extubation is almost always around the first day. And of course, uh, residual lesions are not tolerable anymore. Uh, what is the optimal timing in this 900 uh, patients we observe retrospectively, of course, the uh, result according to the, to the timing for procedure and what we uh, uh, saw that the very early repair uh, is not always associated of a better outcome. Uh, uh, and this, in this series, the, the best uh, result uh, concerning uh, quality of the result were around the seventh day of, the, of life. So the anatomical elements, uh, we will go on one slide, but we have to be aware of them. The grit arteries, their relationship, the coronary artery anatomy, which is not always known uh, by echocardiography. However, it's not justify additional investigations unless there is a, a very special, uh, like single coronary, interarterial anatomy, um, the seminal lunar valves, in particular pulmonary valve anatomy, AV valves, ventricular size and morphology, systemic and pulmonary veins, uh, atrial uh, position, and of course the aorta and all the aortic arch anatomy. Coronary anatomy has many uh, classif classification. This is uh, ours institutions, type one, two, three. Uh, one is uh, uh, being uh, the normal and, uh, and uh, three being the looping anatomy. And the main problem occurs when you have interarterial in intramural coronary arter anatomy, which becomes uh, the small percent, which appears in small percentage of the patient, however, where the uh, post peri and postoperative ischemic events are not uh, uncommon. This is uh, how we, may, we start this patient. We don't uh, uh, particularly open the pleura. It, it, it keeps pulmonary function uh, more stable and preserve uh, quality of uh, blood which will not uh, stay in the pleural space during repair. Uh, once the uh, uh, cannulation and the control of duct, duct ligation uh, of the duct and control on loops of the PA, uh, the strategy of the procedure is uh, start by the lecture of the epicardial view of the heart as a as uh, defined by Claude Planchet, my, my mentor. Uh, aorta is uh, more likely cut in a higher level. Uh, first, the anterior wall, then we observe the coronary anatomy inside in order to avoid to injure a highly uh, arising uh, coronary. And uh, afterwards, the uh, space, intervascular space of in both arteries were mobilized as until the myocardial level, which will allow to, to facilitate the harvesting of coronary arteries. Coronary arteries, I start always with the right one. Uh, they were, they have to be harvested with their large button, uh, of course, aiming to preserve uh, a native aortic valve uh, functional anatomy. However, uh, the uh, coronary button will be shall be privileged to the pulmonary future pulmonary valve. Uh, we perform both by scissors, then but by electrical uh, cautery. That means called Bovi in, in, in the US. Uh, as you see, uh, we go until the lower level. It can be some sometimes myocardial. We don't have to be afraid to go as low as possible to privilege the button. 
the um, we are not fun of extensive mobilization when the coronary anatomy is uh, is uh, regular, uh, in particular with this patient because the uh, uh, structure around the coronary allows to avoid kinking. Pulmonary uh, outflow is uh, rejected in a uh, lower level in order to keep uh, some pulmonary tissue below the segment of bifurcation, uh, avoiding future uh, pulmonary distortion or stenosis. We, we put marking stitches on the commissures to identify uh, properly the valsalva sinus. Then left coronary artery will be uh, reimplanted in the adjacent valsalva sinus in a trapdoor uh, style um, incision uh, with using uh, often 8.0 uh, prolane sutures uh, starting the uh, starting the trying to put the uh, the six o'clock of the coronary button to the corner of the trapdoor. Afterwards, the right coronary will will be right coronary will be implanted in a higher level, as you see. His uh, the the incision finish above the commissure level, because uh, this is a, this technique is based uh, on huge experience and is you can have, apply it in all forms of coronary anatomy. Uh, we will see the unique uh, condition. Then uh, by ending the establishment of the neo-aortic continuity, we will uh, make a counter incision in regard of this coronary artery to reimplant it uh, and to, to uh, avoid also stricture on the aortic anastomosis uh, level postoperatively. Uh, this is a slide from the old times where we were using crystalloid cardioplegia, but at that level, you can already realize that the reimplantation of the coronary arteries are looking fine. We use a fresh pericardial patch to uh, to fill the area due to the harvesting of the buttons, uh, one patch and re-implant the uh, posterior commissure inside the patch. It's a generous fresh pericardial patch. This is the challenging issue. Um, from the sec second sinus arising both coronary arteries with intramural interarterial course of the left one. The uh, strategy is to, in the extreme majority of the patients, almost always, is to harvest both coronary uh, in a common button, then to, um, uh, to divide it in two buttons. Uh, this, for this, we often need to detach the posterior uh, aortic commissure then we have to uh, finish the harvesting of the common button. We had, uh, as you see here, uh, enough tissue because we will unroof the left one in order to, to uh, separate uh, buttons. It, it is debatable if unroofing is mandatory or not, but probably it at least it helps to separate the buttons. Unroofing occurs that way. We have you have to be sure uh, from the trajectory of the lumen, and uh, you have to go uh, as far as hope possible. Still, at the end, it will uh, remain a rigid segment 
because uh, because we are leaving the intima to intima uh, segment. Uh, this this point should be uh, well managed while reimplantation. Uh, here we are after unroofing. We are separating both uh, ostium into cuff. After this uh, division, one shall know that the left coronary artery will be extremely mobilized, then will require reimplantation is in an unusually higher level, uh, often in the middle of the aortic, uh, ascending, new ascending aorta, above or at the level of the suture line. This condition is extremely rare. I did once in my life and it was one a couple of months ago, but it is the uh, alternative to sending, which will uh, result in, in leaving in place an interarterial intramural coronary artery, which can be symptomatic and of course, with the, uh, all the uh, specific character of sending outcome. In this uh, cuff, you can use aortic tissue and even uh, pulmonary tissue if, uh, if you wish. VST, uh, when you have an associated VST, uh, we traditionally, you can close it both from a right atrium, which is uh, not, well exposed in this uh, condition. Right ventricle in the early experience was the approach, but since long years, we use the transpulmonary approach. Uh, as we observed neopulmonary valve regurgitation while we were passing the stitches in the cusp valsalva uh, sinus, uh, nowadays for the roof of the patch, we use a uh, plagiated stitch from the uh, conal septum to the right to the or to the left, from right to the left, or even from associated aortic arch anomaly is uh, uh, concerns a small percentage of the patients. However, it's a uh, makes complicated both procedures and the uh, management. Uh, early experience, we were doing a classical coartation repair from front. Nowadays, we always use homograph patch to adjust this congruence between the native uh, aorta, uh, native pulmonary artery and nat native ascending aorta. Uh, in order to, um, to conclude, we, uh, we will have a, we will give a couple of tricks. Of course, uh, to avoid the, the un, to diminish the unknown uh, parameters in the postoperative coefficient, we always close totally the AST. No justification for leaving AST. Um, the uh, pulmonary pericardial patch should be generous. Uh, often we control PAs and the ductus before bypass. Uh, we repeat that uh, aorta is sectioned high level and pulmonary artery low. Uh, we have to control both ostia before aortic transaction. Uh, don't hesitate to detach com pulmonary commissure if your, um, if your button will not be enough large. Um, always low for the left coronary, always higher for the right coronary independently if you use trapdoor or not. Uh, the discongruence is a common condition between the two segments of the neo aorta and it's all, almost often corrected with the, this, this, the adjusting to the suture on the left side, which allows to put uh, laterally the uh, left coronary artery and not behind the uh, neo pulmonary artery. Um, it can be necessary in uh, 
some patients to reduce native um, pulmonary artery by the resection of the posterior valsalva, uh, where you want uh, be it won't be necessary to reimplant the coronary arteries. Um, when you have coronary loops, it can be necessary to mobilize um, uh, more the coronary arteries. Anterior loop is a specific condition, then you have to insert the patch before coronary reimplantation uh, to avoid injury and uh, stress at that level. Uh, once you came off bypass, if you pull back for decannulation or for any reason too much the neopulmonary trunk, you will stretch the anterior coronary right looping right coronary and you will create ischemia and it's a uh, more you stretch, more you have ischemia and more you have ischemia, more you will be in trouble. Um, it can be necessary to use 9O proline for the uh, uh, type C intra arterial intramural coronary artery uh, when you reimplant. Um, when you have a side by side Griantary relationship, it's useful to displace the, the distal anastomosis side to the right side, avoiding stretch and uh, uh, stenosis of the left coronary artery attention not to have too generous uh, homograph patch when you do coartation, uh, TGA coartation VST repair because it can stretch the pulmonary uh, after the compner and create stenosis. Don't forget in this condition also systemic inspection of the right ventricle outflow and uh, also division of uh, potential right ventric uh, parietal band at that level. There are some uh, specific, specific conditions, uh, including bicuspid pulmonary valve and uh, relative LVO2. We made a study on that and we think that the pulmonary valve, independently of his bicuspid or not, Z-score should not be uh, more than 1.8. Uh, in multiple VSTs, a true one, the uh, still switch procedure can be more uh, suitable with the banding than doing only banding and uh, delaying switch later on. Uh, light referral is common in uh, uh, some areas of the world. We had a significant experience on the 19th and we conclude that uh, up to two months, uh, independently of the uh, echographic uh, parameters, you can confer, uh, go for switch. Beyond that age, uh, we calculate LV mass and left ventricle mass and volume in volume, and we index it. Mass alone is not enough, uh, 30, 35 gram per square meter because the uh, cardiac volume uh, should be um, also calculated. And if the index uh, mass on volume is about 1.5, you can go, uh, still go for a, a safe switch, primary switch with, of course, a potential ECMO background. Otherwise, we use rapid two stage with modified BT shunt and loose pulmonary artery bending 24 millimeter uh, with knowing that the first night will be uh, will be difficult for the intensivist. I would thank with this occasion my mentor, Todd Planche and other friends, Francois Lacrugayer, Anand Seaf, and in, 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 inventor of our intensive care, uh, Mademoiselle Bruneau. Thank you for your attention. So we can go for the quiz. Okay, I will share the second quiz. Okay, could you see it? Of course. Okay, you can vote. We have we five have questions. New question for the TGA. 
do you have a question, uh, Krishna? Yeah, a uh, couple of questions. One uh, question on your intraoperative management. You said you use normothermia, and I know that you use. If have you changed from potassium cardioplegia, or are you still using the potassium cardioplegia every fifteen minutes, ten to fifteen minutes? Yeah, it is. It is a syringe of uh, potassium and CPB one connected to the. Uh, Cardiopulmonary bypass circuit, which is given in a in a def defined uh, dose uh, for the uh, aortic level, it, it should be 40 to 50 ml per minute. First dose, two two minutes, then intracoronary um, uh, around 20 20 ml uh, per minute, or the, to, according to the experience of the drop level it 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 is uh, intracoronary it is a uh, it can be uh, not uh, engage some of our colleagues however uh, we didn't have particular trouble at that level at least in switch patients and uh, we repeat it every 15 to 20 minutes so according to the cross clamp time we repeat one or two times. And do you use any dilators at all? Uh, phenoxybenzamine or... Uh, Not at all. We don't use... Uh, we, we don't use... Uh, Enoximon is a wide dilator. Right. It's an uh, inotropist. And it is uh, less... Um, the capillary leak is much less than uh, the other one. Pro uh -huh. oh, uh, I, I forgot the, the, science, the chemical name, which is more uh, used in this setting. We don't use any vasopressor uh, since uh, there are other problems uh, related to, and we, and we stop uh, deep sedation when once operation is ended with the with the skin future, we, we leave only mo some morphine uh, going to, to uh, wake up the patient and uh, extubate. So what sort of blood pressures do you accept in the post-operative period? Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, switches uh, is, uh, don't like too much low pressure. However, uh, what counts is not only blood pressure, is the blood gases, lactate level, and urine output. So but those uh, are... I, I think 40 mean pressure is, uh, is quite enough postoperatively since the patient is, uh, has good blood gases, no acidosis, and continue to urine. Right. Thank you. So, uh, Emma? Yes. I, I, I have questions. Uh, I noticed uh, uh, in your slide, uh, you always uh, close the ASD. Yes. In the switch. Uh, and uh, which conditions you must keep the ASD open? It's a very difficult question. I don't know because earlier I was convinced Still, I have uh, some conviction, but not for this kind of patient that uh, for LV, relatively hypoplastic LV or whatever it is, don't leave ASD open because it is, uh, it is, it is not uh, justified except uh, for the uh, day one TAPVC where, where you can judge that some more oxygenated right to left, left to right shunt uh, in the PAs will diminish it, the early resistance. I, I didn't, I'm not able to show it uh, scientifically, but it sounds good. Uh, it sounds good. But earlier I was leaving some residual AHT for the small RV. Mm. And this, this is for the newborn, it's, it's uh, 
it's uh, dangerous because you lose the, you have already an RV failure more in newborn, more than LV failure postoperatively. And, uh, and uh, if the saturation goes below 80s, it has a, a systemic and myocardial effect. So it's, it's already when you don't have ASD, as you may know, in newborn, the saturation is not normal. The blood finds some area to pass from the right to the left and you are around 90% even less. So in this condition, not pulmonary atresia, intact septum or Epstein, whatever it is, I'm not, I'm not uh, convinced that any residual AST has an advantage. Okay, thank you. So we can go for the quiz results, Alexandra. Yes, here is the result, uh, Emre. Could you see it? No. Ah, no, you cannot, okay. Yeah. Okay. 70% uh, of the, so prenatal diagnosis is remain uh, not, not common for the majority of the audience. Mm -hmm. uh, and the majority of the audience working in centers where they do less than 20 switches per year, which is, which is normal. Uh, however, we have a 22% centers uh, doing uh, close to two switches per month. Mm -hmm. And uh, the most common stitch used is 70. However, 80 is coming just behind, and we have a uh, uh, we are our stars using 90, which we, we felicitate. And uh, VST is more often closed by the right atrium, which is not surprising. And the native pulmonary artery comes second, as we used to do. And the most uh, challenging question was the late referral TGA. Of course, this late referral doesn't include the age of the patient. Of If the patient is able to come at five years later, or which can happen, uh, it's, uh, I, th I believe atrial switch is uh, safer. However, it, in the first of year of flight, so some people are doing ECMO, uh, some people are doing rapid two stage as we are using to do, and some still do atrial switch. Excellent information. So we'll pursue with our friend, uh, Shujun Lee, professor from Fubai Hospital, Matt, and uh, former uh, fellow in my Lanong Hospital and uh, my good friend. Okay. Uh, so now uh, in China, it's a evening, so uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, my invitation. It's my great pleasure to uh, join the web webinar. So today I, I just uh, talk about the bioventricle repair strategy for the TGA VSDPS. So the uh, I think that the the TGA VSPS uh, means the the. The ultra uh, ascends from the right ventricle. The pulmonary actually uh, ascends from the left ventricle, and uh, and uh, uh, there are a big uh, VSD uh, and uh, uh, pulmonary stenosis, all the sub uh, ventricular stenosis. So today's topic, uh, including the 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 the, the TGA type DIV with uh, pulmonary stenosis. So, uh, LV all know the the ventricular aorta disorder with the uh, ventricular septal defect, and uh, pulmonary stenosis is still challenge to 
pediatric cardiac surgeon. So the anatomical uh, re requirement for the bioventricular repair uh, include, sorry, include the the, the indication includes the where de development uh, distal pulmonary artery branch defined as an, uh, the NACAD uh, index more than 130. And uh, the balance uh, ventricles. Uh, uh, and finally, there's a non severe uh, straddling or overriding of the uh, atrial ventricle valves. And uh, it's expected that after surgical repair, the, pitch, the patients could have a nearly anatomical correction and uh, uh, preserve the competence and the great potential of both aortic and pulmonary valves and uh, normal long term uh, hemodynamic uh, performance. There are, there are six procedures of the bioventricular repair for TGVSD, uh, VSD APS includes the RST, uh, the Damascus, the Rail, the Nicardo, the half rotation of the tracks, uh, arterial stars, and uh, the double root tracks uh, translocation. Uh, I will try to introduce those uh, uh, procedures uh, subsequently. First, the, the justly uh, procedure indication. Uh, I think the sub aortic and the near to the aortic valve is an uh, optimal location for VSD. Larger RV to PA county should be considered for the older infants and the children. So here's the main techniques for your study procedures. When doing the, the RV incision, avoiding injury of the aortic valve and enlarge the VSD. Uh, and uh, importantly, Condil from uh, RV to PA should be placed uh, on the left side of the uh, atrium. So this is a, a first data for uh, 10 years justly uh, results, 100 patients. Uh, in, in our uh, institutions, cohort, there are no uh, left ventricular outtracks the nuisance after procedures. Early deaths occurred in three patients. Reoperation due, due to the conduce due uh, the nuisance was in, uh, in the twenty percent of patients in follow up seven years. So uh, as for the indication for the real procedures. The optimal location of VSD is uh, similar to the uh, rusty, sub aortic and uh, near to the aortic valve. For small infants whose pulmonary artery might still have green, uh, uh, have growth uh, potential, uh, right, real procedures is indicated. There are similar surgical tips uh, with the rest uh, uh, procedures. When they're performing the RVOT uh, restriction, pulmonary root should be uh, detached and the pulmonary root was placed ahead of the aortic artery or uh, on left of aortic artery. A posterior uh, margin of the pulmonary artery should be suited to the right incision and uh, using the uh, mon uh, cups patch to repair the arterial margin. Uh, this is uh, in first data of the drill. So, uh, same with the uh, study procedures, 
the left uh, uh, ventricular object obstruction was not noted in any patients uh, in our hospital. There are two early days reoperation due to a pulmonary regurgitation and the stenosis was required in the 20% uh, of the patients. Nearly 50 patients developed a more than moderate pulmonary viral regurgitation. For NICADO procedures, the location of the VSD should it could be a known committed or sub pulmonary uh, uh, sub pulmonary. Uh, currently, actish cause should be a normal. So this slide shows the main techniques for NICAD procedures. The aortic is uh, harvested by division of the uh, sub aortic uh, coronal muscle. And the main point is actually is, is divided about uh, pulmonary valve. The stenotic uh, pulmonary uh, annulus and the coronal septum uh, are inside. The aortic root is suited into the opened uh, left uh, ventricle out track. The distal uh, uh, main pulmonary artery have been translocated uh, arterially, uh, and the uh, the the left uh, the Lacanto maneuver is needed, and it is suited into the right right uh, ventricle outstretched. For the classic uh, Nicardo, the the RVO uh, reconstruction is complete with the uh, arterial patch. A gross potential of aortic root might be uh, preserved after Nicardo uh, procedures. Due to the uh, data from the uh, multiple centers, many causes of the reoperation were right ventricular obstruction or pulmonary valve regurgitation. There was a no uh, left side lesion leading to uh, Reoperations all the uh, all these uh, reports. So now we are moving to the double root translocation. The location of the VSD is similar to the Nikaido, uh, and the non committed and the sub uh, uh, sub pulmonary sub arterial corners is needed, and. Uh, the coronary artery patterns uh, may be, uh, is normal may be, uh, and uh, or abnormal. According to the technical uh, complexity, uh, as, uh, I think double root structure should be uh, considered for patients whose weight is at least uh, uh, eight to 10 uh, kilos. Uh, this slide shows the main techniques of the left ventricle uh, outtract reconstruction in double root tra uh, translocation. Uh, aortic and pulmonary roots with uh, similar valves were harvested respectively, keeping the infundibular uh, septum intact. Uh, Arcus aortic roots was uh, to release to the uh, AVOT with the uh, entrapped stitch. Then we, uh, we, we replant one side of coronary artery routinely, uh, mostly uh, right side. So how to do the right ventricular outtract uh, reconstruction in double root? Uh, the pulmonary root was placed ahead of uh, 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 aortic artery by a Lacombe uh, maneuver. Pulmonary root was injured by the menstrual cup patch anteriorly. Then the new valve, the pulmonary root, was uh, was occurred with the RVOT by end to end. 
uh, from uh, the data in our hospitals. Uh, there, there are uh, 163 patients uh, received the procedure. The early mortality occurred in seven patients, which were mostly small infants. The reoperations re uh, were needed in uh, uh, 5% of patients and due to the RVOT obstruction, the pulmonary regurgitation and the mitral, uh, mitral regurgitation. More, more than moderate pulmonary valve regurgitation developed in nearly uh, 18 patients, mostly who experienced the pulmonary uh, root enlarged with the monocusp uh, patch uh, materials. So the aortic and the pulmonary annulus diameters uh, was measured by a CT scan. Uh, according to the data, we can observe the aortic and the pulmonary root still uh, uh, have growth potential after operation. The Z score of the aortic and the pulmonary annulus diameter is almost, uh, almost the same with uh, uh, normal children. So for half ro rotation of the tracks, the location of VSD is similar to the Nikaido, include the non-committed and the sub-pulmonary. Uh, aortic uh, pulmonary uh, anterior posterior position, sub-aortic corners, well uh, develop pulmonary annulus nearly a uh, normal diameter and the normal uh, coronary artery course were necessary for this, uh, uh, for these procedures. First, the aortic and the pulmonary root with the valve were, was res uh, res resected uh, and black. Then aortic and pulmonary root were uh, rotated by half a circle and switch it into the left uh, ventricle outtract and the right uh, ventricle outtract uh, respectively. Both cordy arteries were uh, re-implanted. So then this uh, pulmonary root was enlarged with a uh, uh, monocaps patch arteriously. So, uh, So according to the report published in the uh, 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 European Journal of Cardiac Surgery, we can see both the aortic and the pulmonary annular still have a growth potential after procedures. All three patients with enlarged pulmonary root with a, with a menocaps patch developed more than moderate pulmonary uh, valve regurgitation. So another option is uh, DKS operation. The main con uh, consideration for DKS is uh, the position of VSD, the su uh, subaortic sub muscular stenosis. Patients with uh, sub uh, pulmonary VSD, non-committed, small VSD uh, are uh, candidated for DKS. The main uh, technique uh, include the VS enlargement or not, powerful uh, connection between left ventricle to, air, to air, aortic and anterior uh, uh, anastomosis of aortic and pulmonary root and the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery uh, conduit. However, attention should, should be paid, uh, paid for the pulmonary valve fraction at a long term follow up. So uh, in summary, the bioventricular repair for these uh, challenging patients should uh, cost uh, customers uh, the, the individually. Po patients age, the VS uh, position, and the other intra uh, cardiac uh, morphology, um, 
malformation should be taken uh, into the con uh, consideration. For older infants or children, we can choose the, 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 the Rasselli procedure. However, it should be noted the condyostenosis would happen in the long-term follow-up. For small uh, infants with sub ART VSD, the real operation would be suitable. And uh, probably uh, while regurgitation may occur the, uh, at a long-term follow-up, patients with non-committed uh, or sub pulmonary VSD uh, sub aortic corners, NICAD could be a re reasonable choice for such uh, patients. Another operation is a double root translocation, which is a truly uh, anatomically uh, reconstruction. Half uh, rotation of the tracks, uh, arterial cells could be selected for the patients with uh, anterior, uh, anterior uh, motorial great vessel and the well uh, developed uh, pulmonary uh, annulus. And that the DKS operation is uh, suitable for the patients uh, with small VSD as the sub. Uh, aortic uh, muscular stenosis. So thank you very much. So I, I just say, uh, I just worked in the Huai Hostel in Beijing, not, not in Jinzhou. And uh, my <laughs> name is Shou Jun Li. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Shou Jun. So let's go immediately for the question. We are excellently in time. I'm going to share. Uh, there is the, only one question because I knew that children will say everything. Okay. <laughs> yes. So, children, I will ask one question. Yeah. Uh, how do you uh, justify? A, a root translocation or rotation mm -hmm. since you will not leave uh, the native pulmonary valve uncut. Since you will do transcellular patch with cusp or without cusp? So you, you, you say the, 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 the rotation? Yes. If the yeah. pulmonary artery size is small, why to do rotation and not uh, Nikaido, for example? So uh, if the, the pulmonary, uh, uh, the, the annulus is small, uh, I just, uh, uh, I just put the uh, the pulmonary uh, ahead of the aorta and uh, enlarge with the patch. But so there is you don't you don't have have the advantage to have a valve anymore. You know, uh, if the, the valve is uh, uh, is uh, too small, uh, the uh, annulus is a. Uh, uh, too small, uh, annulus is too small. Uh, I just do the Nikado. Uh, okay. I, I, I don't do that, uh, okay. the, the double root. Shujun, when do you do, you, when you do Nikaido, do you leave the coronaries or you detach? Uh, I just, uh, uh, I, I, I just uh, read, uh, uh, we implant the one side of the coronary. Okay. Uh, and mostly the right. Okay. And uh, last question. When there is a coronary artery looping in front of the aorta, mm -hmm. anterior loop, do you do still? Uh, you uh, do you do still Nikaido or 
or you change your uh, strategy? I don't have a story. Uh, if uh, I think if uh, you, uh, you 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 know that uh, the corner is uh, loop the the outer, uh, I think I I can I can do the Nikado or W to translocate. No problem. You detach. You mobilize it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. You need to uh, implant a new uh, a new place. Okay, so let's go for the answer. Question, uh, Krishna. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Dr. Lee, very nice presentation. I wanted to ask a question about the technique of double root translocation. Yeah. When there is pulmonary to mitral continuity, how do you protect the mitral valve when you explant or when you harvest the pulmonary root? because that is one of the problems. And in even your series, a uh, few patients have mitral regurgitation. So uh, um, what is the tips and tricks for that? Uh, generally, uh, uh, we choose the double translocation. Uh, first, the, 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 palm, uh, the pulmonary valve is not too small. And the yes. second, we just uh, 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 opened the pulmonary annulus uh, with the valve commissure, not to injure the valve, uh, uh, the valve left. And uh, then my question uh, is how to protect the mitral valve because when there is pulmonary mitral continuity, then uh, generally I think in uh, TGVST. Uh, and uh, with the pulmonary TGVSD uh, and the pulmonary splenosis, uh, if the patient is uh, uh, not too small, uh, I mean, uh, not uh, the small infants, maybe uh, 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 the, the younger in the, younger than the six or five or six months, uh, the, 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 the older infants and the children, uh, you you just uh, uh, just uh, cut the the pulmonary valve, uh, valve from from the mitral. Uh, you, you cannot uh, injure the the mitral valve left. Right. In the small infants, maybe the mitral valve regurgitation is a problem. Yes. We our time is over. We will just see the. Yeah, still Rastelli have the lead. Rev remains very French. Mm -hmm. And uh, the alternative, first alternative is uh, Nikado. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's clear we have uh, to pursue. Excellent uh, session. I think we will uh, try to, to organize another one uh, next year, despite the uh, COVID, this, even COVID is not here and we are not obliged to do webinars. I think this practice is, has become uh, very common. I thank uh, Shujun and uh, Krishna and also Madame Duval and Dariella uh, from also Peter's company for the making this event uh, occur and all the audience for their participations. Have a nice day. Bye Thank, bye. You. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Professor Belli. And well. also, um, on the behalf of Peter Surgical, I would like to share my deep thanks to all of you three, uh, Professor Lee, Professor Belli, and Dr. Hires. I think that uh, you have been able to prepare a very interactive session, mixing uh, your experience, video, and also quiz. And uh, we had more than 1,400 attendees and a lot from China, I will say, uh, but it's a great success. And uh, for sure, we will be very positive to continue to uh, exchange uh, uh, best patting sharing and knowledge uh, all over the world. So let's, uh, let's meet in 2021 in good condition.